Thank you, Melissa. I'm so grateful to be here. I'm going to start recording on my end too. So I've got that. Um, okay. I think we're good. We're live, but thank you, Melissa, for that intro. I'm grateful to be here. Um, I'll start with just like a background of me. I know Melissa gave a quick snippet. I'm a totally normal guy. I live out in Southern California in Orange County um, with my wife and our eight month old daughter. On Tuesday mornings, we actually go on morning dates. So we did this morning family walk to Starbucks, which is 50% off today on any ice beverage, I guess, just so you guys know, um, which is great. There's a little bit of financial wellness in that. Like, ooh, half off, like, oh, penny. There's a saying, penny saved is a penny earned. I actually don't believe that, but we'll get there. Um, so as Melissa said, who am I right now? Just, just so you guys are like, who is this guy? Should I believe what he says? Right now I'm an entrepreneur and I'm an investor. I own a few businesses. I lead a global team that's done over 20 million in global sales. And I co-own an investment firm in which we have 22 real estate doors, a few venture capital investments. I'm not wealthy yet. I'd like to think I'm on the way, um, but you know, totally normal guy. And I look at myself now and sometimes I, I'm like, wow, really? I have an investment company. I have all these investments and lead this big team and all these things. I'm like, how did that happen? How did I get there? Because it wasn't always that way. I didn't grow up in wealth. I didn't grow up in any of that. I grew up, you know, middle, lower class. I lived in, you know, subsidized housing when I was younger and moved a lot and had to move around the country and go to new schools and all these things. And I think oftentimes your pain can become your purpose. So my pain was like, gosh, I, I'm, I'm moving, I'm changing, we're in subsidized housing, we don't have a lot. I, I felt like as the oldest child, I had to like, be like, okay, well, I can't spend a lot of money because we don't have a lot, right? And like, oh, I can't get the extra guac for $2 and different things. And it kind of my childhood drove me to believe and think like, okay, what is success? It's like making a lot of money. When I make a lot of money, I'll be successful, happy, all the things. And gosh, I'm so grateful to be here with you guys. So what that drove me to do is like, who makes money? Okay, these businessmen I see. And this is, you know, I'm in middle school, high school, growing up. Uh, okay, these businessmen, all right, maybe I'll go to, to business school, I'll become a businessman. So, you know, worked hard enough in school to get into business school, uh, Bentley University in the Northeast in the Boston area. And went to business school there, it was like, wow, accounting is super boring to me. Let me, I like finance. I'll go into finance, these guys on Wall Street, these finance guys make a lot of money, I'll do that. On this quest to go make money because when you make the six figures, everything will be well in the world, right? So I got, I actually got my master's degree in finance and I figured I better use this. Went into the working world um, and kind of climbed the ladder in the finance world, in Wall Street type stuff, but in Boston. I worked for a credit fund. We raised a $500 million credit fund and I learned so much along the way and I put my head down, I climbed the ladder and I got to a point where I was a VP in my firm and I stepped back, I'm like, wait a second, I've like reached that destination I've been seeking. And you know, I've been making the good money in finance, living in the nice apartment, driving the sports car. And I'm like, this is what I've been working towards. Now I was happy, I, I wasn't like an unhappy person, but I wasn't fulfilled. I realized I was like, is this what I've been working towards? And I kind of reflected. I think that's important in life to reflect, to reflect where am I at? Where have I been? Where am I at now? But where am I going? So I started to think in a mentor, started to surround myself with different people and mentors. And they asked me, if you keep doing what you're doing, where will you be in five years? And are you okay with that? And I'm like, gosh, I'm just going to make a little bit more. I'm going to have a little bit better title, but I'm going to be in the same place. Is that something I want? And I realized, no, I wasn't long on that job I was in because I was just like moving money around, doing different things, like doing deals. I learned a ton, but I realized I want to be a CEO. I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to do different things. When I moved to California from Boston about four years ago, I started to look at people's lives that I wanted to emulate. I'm like, you own the bit, you own business, you're a CEO, you're an entrepreneur, all the things. And I was like, I want to do that. How do I do that? Long story short, I got into entrepreneurship, a turnkey way, and it's been a beautiful blessing. And I, I think I definitely work harder now, but it's just opened so many doors for me. Now, I say all this to come back to what I want to cover today is, that's just a little background on me, is financial wellness and financial literacy. Because while I got my master's degree in finance, it's like, 
one of the kind of highest levels of education in finance specifically, I didn't learn anything about making money. I didn't learn anything about being wealthy. I didn't learn anything about financial literacy. I learned how to do accounting and finance and how to read a balance sheet and certain stuff, which would, would help me in that stuff. I didn't, I didn't know how to build wealth. I knew how to be a good employee in finance. That's it. That's what school taught me. So I realized financial literacy was something I had to take into my own hands. Like that was something that I had to do. And I go back to like reflecting now, having my master's in finance, having my own investment firm and different stuff. And, you know, on my way to building wealth and having certain assets and things, I look back, I'm like, gosh, there was a point where I was in college scraping by, getting my master's degree, working as an intern, barely making any money. I remember my, my roommate was working full time at that time. And I was like, dude, I need like 2,500 bucks. I had to borrow money from him. He's like, I'm an accountant. You need to show me a budget. How are you going to pay me back? And I'm like, you don't trust me. I'm like, all right, put together a budget. And this is just to show I was like, there's a, a, a really valuable lessons I got when my back was against the wall financially. And I had to like scrape by. I think you learn a lot in those. And I remember in high school, you know, my parents got divorced. I was in motels and smelling like cigarettes, going to school and different stuff. And I had a great childhood. I'm making it sound worse than it is. But um, just to show those low points really help. Like I heard Ed Milet speak this past week at our, our annual convention. And he said, You're, when you feel disqualified, you're the most qualified to help the person you used to be. So those low points are really what qualify us to help other people. And when I look back at those, that's what qualified me and, and pushed me to go get my master's in finance, pushed me to go learn about finance and building wealth and all the different things. And I'm going to go through five to thrive in a recession. Recession's coming. It's kind of already here, but it's technically coming. And five steps to thrive. That's going to be the bulk of it. But I want to set this foundation here first. And I remember going to my roommate like for the 2500 I'm like, all right, we would go out on the weekends and be like $50 per weekend at the bar. Because I'm like, I'll get a few drinks. He's like, dude, I'm with you all the time. How are you going to spend $50 at the bar? And he's like picking apart my budget. And he gave it to me and I ended up paying back. But it just goes to show like I've had my back against the wall a lot of times financially. Where, you know, negative net worth, I'm in debt, I'm not making a lot. I'm spending more than I make. I'm like, how am I going to get out of this? And those moments you learn and grow so much. And I think there's three options. There's fight, flight, and freeze. There's like, I'm my back's against the wall, I'm gonna fight forward. Oh, it's a recession, I'm gonna fight forward. Or there's flight, I'm running away from it. Someone help me, someone else, like something outside of me, please come and help me. Or there's freeze, just like, I don't even know what to do. Now, we're gonna go through five steps, five to thrive in a recession. So let's segue into Oh, a few years after that, I had to borrow money. A few years after that, I was making money in my finance career. And then I was lending. I lent my parents money at some points and my friends money and they all paid me back. But it felt good. I like flipped the script. So we always know we're one decision away in our mind, like our life, when we take 100% responsibility for it, it's so liberating. It's like, it's not my boss, the economy, uh, my parents, my boyfriend, my spouse, my wife, my whatever. When like I take full responsibility. Um, so where are we at today? Like what is the state of the economy? We've been in a bull market or an up market since like 08, right? 08 was the great recession, real estate tanked. There was a lot of reasons for that. We won't go into depth for that, but there was bubbles, real estate bubble, people were getting mortgages left and right. Anyways, it all came crashing down. And a lot of people were like, whoa, my portfolio's gone or half gone in stocks and real estate and everything. And there's a lot of learning lessons there. And I will say, this is actually one of the first points, but the, the successful people or the right, people with the right mindset, and typically they become wealthy, actually thrive in the winter time in the economic winter. So in 08, yeah, they might have lost some, but they learned a lot. They realized everyone's freezing. Okay, I got to move. I'm going to go buy assets on sale. I'm going to start saving more money. I'm going to start a side hustle. I'm going to start finding ways to make more money so I can buy stocks on sale, real estate on sale. I could start a business. I could help other people pro solve their problems. So they get like resourceful when most people freeze and they're trying to pinch a penny. 
they get resourceful. So we're going to kind of cover that. But since then, 09 and beyond, we came out of the Great Recession, and it's been an upward trajectory economy. And the average, you know, upward bull market might last five to seven years on the longer end. This lasted until like the global pandemic, right? Until what, 2020? So that was like, like over a decade, 10, 11, 12 years of upward. That's way beyond. And you know why? We were printing money. Printing. The government can just print money. And I don't blame a lot of us. We're a consumer society and we spend more than we make and we're in debt. Why? The U.S. government does that. We're in tons of debt. Insurmountable, I might even say. We just keep kicking the can down the road. That's a whole other topic. I don't like to even think about that because it makes it hard to sleep at night. But it then bleeds into us as consumers. We model after our leadership, after our government, right? We spend more than we make. We have the credit card. We don't balance our budget. We don't you know, look at this stuff. We don't, and guess what? We don't get taught financial literacy. It's up to us to go find it, to go figure it out, to go teach it to ourselves. And that's why stuff like this is awesome. So 12 year bull market, then global pandemic happens, which is like, whoa, what the heck is gonna happen? Understandably, I get it, but the government's like, let's make sure we stabilize. Let's keep printing more money. Let's give people checks, just relief checks and this and that, and huge unemployment and all this stuff, just to keep the economy afloat and prop it up so there's not this global pandemic and then economic crisis to boot. Now with all of this like prop, artificial propping up the economy, not because people are like, you know, doing more, you know, life is seasonal, right? For those of you, I grew up in Boston, there's summertime, right? And then there's fall and it's beautiful. And then there's wintertime and it's cold and it's stormy and it's, you might not see the sun for a week. And it's like, oh gosh, this is uncomfortable. But after winter, there's spring, the flowers start to blossom and then it's summer again. Life is seasonal, relationships are seasonal, business cycles are seasonal, the economy is seasonal. So when we've had this extended summertime for a long time, we're due for the winter. Right now, we're heading into the economic winter. What is a recession? It's two straight quarters, 90-day 90, 90 quarters, so six straight months of economic decline or the GDP goes down. That's right where we're headed. I'm assuming in Q3 and Q4 that's going to happen. The stock market's already down like about 20%. That means we're in a bear market, and that usually happens first. So now, we're, now we've level set, right? Okay, we've built the foundation. Where are we at economically? Okay, we're kind of headed into a downturn. How, what are, like, I'm going to go through five to thrive. These aren't the only five. These are just kind of the five I came up with for this and I think are relevant right now and in all my studies. So this is where the note taking begins. Five to thrive in a recession, how to thrive through the recession and beyond and really set yourself up for the rest of your life. Because these are, these are kind of principles. They aren't like, oh, invest in this stock or that. No, these are principles for the rest of your life. And I'm going to give you some resources, but it'll be up to you to take them in, to go do your own research, to go do your own studying and implement it yourself and really build your mindset. The first to thrive in a recession or really any time is your mindset and your financial literacy. That's part of what we're doing today. Mindset at the end of the day is everything. Like how you think, what you tell yourself, the thoughts that constantly repeat in your head really becomes your life. It becomes the outcome of your life. You're like, oh, I'm bored, it's mundane, it's day after day, week after week, year after year. Oh, I'm not gonna grow that much. Oh, I'm just this, I'm just that. I don't know how to invest or the, I'm never gonna be rich. Whatever you tell yourself, will you'll that will come true. You'll, I guess, manifest that. But if you start telling yourself, you know what? I can learn this. I can start to invest. I can start to, to make more than I spend. I can start to put some aside. I can start to learn about compound interest. I could learn about the stock market or crypto or real estate or what all these different asset classes we'll touch on. I could read a few books. Wealth is a, is kind of a science. And again, I'm not wealthy yet. I'm not a multimillionaire, but I'm studying it. And I'm, I'm the most qualified to teach myself before I started to do all these things. Because before I was just, you know, working, spending more than I make, putting in my credit card, end of the year, I'd get a bonus, pay off my credit card and be like, Poof. Oh, did I break even this year? No, I'm a little bit down. And I just do that year after year and it adds up. Now, I work for a debt fund. So I love debt when it's attached to a cash flowing asset. I do not love credit card debt. Worst thing you can have. First thing you do is pay that off. We'll get there too. But financial literacy, how do you build it? 
you need to take it into your own hands. No one's going to just come in and teach you financial literacy. You need to hop on the webinar. You need to go read the book. You need to go. Tony Robbins might put out a, you know, a five day challenge. I think he's putting on soon. You might do that and it's free on like the recessions coming, or you might start listening to podcasts about money or wealth or this or business or that, or entrepreneurship or being the best you you can be sprouting where you're planted in whatever role and job you're in how i thought about building financial literacy is i was on my way to work what my life used to look like i would wake up i'd snooze my alarm until the last second i had to leave for work i took a boat to work from boston to hingham where my office was i would like be almost running to the boat i would just hop on i'd then get on my phone check emails you know text maybe social media different things where i'm like just answering everyone else. I'm putting out fires. And I was like, gosh, what? And then I would just go into my day. You kind of feel stress and the cortisol release. What I transitioned to is like, wait, let me start the day for me. I woke up a little earlier. I started a morning routine. There's a great book, The Miracle Morning by Hal Elrod. And I started to do things like meditate, read, a little bit of movement or exercise, hydrate, a little bit of visualization or affirmations. That's a whole different thing, but it really comes back to... <laughs> When I studied successful people, I was like, whoa, they pretty much all meditate and or pray. It, it kind of can be similar. They all have some sort of morning routine. They all express gratitude. They're all pretty dang healthy. Not all, I'm generalizing. Um, they all use different things like affirmations, visualization. They all have coaches or mentors. And they all like master and study their craft. There's patterns. So I was like, if I want to be wealthy, I got to kind of study these people and do these things. So I started to like, let me start listening to podcasts. Let me start listening to audiobooks. Let me start reading books. A great way to start building your financial literacy. I'll give you a few books I've read that are like, these are things where it's like, this is where I can begin. For things to change, I got to make a change. I can keep going. And if you're like doing awesome right now, keep doing it. But if you're like, ah, I'm kind of breaking even, or I have a lot of debt or this or that, or I'd like to reach a goal, you got to like become the next level version of you. Where does that start? Learn, get mentorship. And books are people's life experience packed into like a five, 10 hour read. So a few great books, you can write these down, just start one at a time. But Rich Dad, Poor Dad was like, it really shifted my mindset by Robert Kiyosaki. Totally shifted my mindset around wealth, around money. Money's just energy, it's just, it's currency. It's made up paper. It's just the value we put behind it. And it doesn't buy happiness, but money's right up there with oxygen, we need it to live. So when we start to like think your money, what is your money mindset? Scarcity, with the way I grew up, like money doesn't grow on trees. The, you know, I, I'll never make more money. I'm only worth this. We got to think about our value, our worth, how we think of ourselves. I'm a, I'm an eighty thousand dollar a year person. Like that's it. That's what you're gonna bring in if that is your standard, your your frequency, your temperature. Or I'm a sixty thousand, or a hundred thousand, or whatever it is. We got to start to raise our standards, our frequency, and how do we do that? We build our financial literacy. We build our mindset and we start to build our skill sets. How do I become more valuable in the marketplace? An abundant mindset says there's opportunity everywhere around me. How can I be more valuable where I'm at? How do I sprout where I'm planted right now? How do I be more valuable to the company? Am I on commission? Is there a way to make more there? Do I start a side hustle? Do I have a business idea I could do after hours? Whatever it is. Um, so Rich Dad Poor Dad, Secrets of a Millionaire Mind is great by, I think it's T. Harv Eckler. The Richest Man in Babylon is short, not easy read, it's kind of written in Old English, but it's all the principles you need to be wealthy, very, very short. Think and Grow Rich is the ultimate personal development and building wealth book, it is not an easy read. An easy one and a fun one, and this is the last one I'll recommend, is You Are a Badass at Making Money by Jen Sincero. That's a fun one, and these are, can be audible books too. But just pick one and just start reading or listening to it. I also start listening to podcasts, Robert Kiyosaki, different people. Um, so the first thing, mindset and financial literacy. It's going to be up to you to go build that. And if you don't, that's fine. But don't expect your financial situation or anything to change. Expect to just keep growing a little bit in your income. Your lifestyle will go up a little bit. Um, and... 
you'll kind of keep breaking even or whatever it is, whatever the current situation is. Sorry, something just popped up in my computer. All right, second, second, that's the first. So mindset, building your financial literacy. Like your, your life, your happiness, your success begins and ends in your mind. What you think about, you bring about. Second, this is a concept that I had no idea about until a few years ago. It's a concept, and this is what you'll probably read in a lot of these books or hear in podcasts or hear what these wealthy people are doing. Pay yourself first. So what I did when I worked in finance, I got my paycheck every two weeks. Taxes came out. I did have some 401k investment and benefit stuff all came out. I would then see what was left over. I spent it hoping there was some left over that I could invest or put aside for retirement or whatever it was. What wealthy people do is money comes in, they pay themselves first before any bill, their mortgage, any creditor, anyone. And taxes, as an employee, you, the taxes just come out. You do have to pay that first. As an entrepreneur, they don't for me. But what, what wealthy do is they get their paycheck or they get whatever it comes in, they pay themselves first. So a certain percentage or amount goes right out into an investment account or savings account or retirement account or something. Now, where to start is at least 10%. So where you can start is, okay, I get this paycheck. What if I automatically put a certain percent right away into a different account that I don't spend? That is paying yourself first. Then whatever's left over, I have left to spend. And at the minimum, a great place to start is 10%. Do you guys have a 401k or anything? Okay. So if you have 401k, that is a good place to start because it's easy. It's done for you. A lot of the richest people in the world, they don't get rich off 401ks, but it is a way to start. It's better than nothing, and it's better than just saving money because inflation means if inflation was 8% last year and I had $100 in my savings account, this year it's now worth 92 because 8% inflation. So my money went down. That's why we invest and have our money make money, and we'll get there. That's step four. Um, so pay yourself first. 10% minimum should go. And if you have matching or anything, in your 401k, do that, do the full match. But where you can start is, let's say you put 10% of your paycheck into your 401k, that's where you can start. The goal is get up to 30% of your paycheck. You pay yourself first. And when you start doing that, that's gonna be huge. And you start living off the other 70%. And if you want to increase your lifestyle, you gotta go make more money. So. I want you guys to work towards 30% or even for Grant Cardone. He's a real estate mogul billionaire. He says 40%. He said he did. He would save and or invest 40% of his paycheck and he would just live on the rest. What you'll realize a lot of these wealthy people, the way they get there is they don't just buy the boats and cars and increase their lifestyles. They make more. They stack cash. They have liquidity. They invest it. They make their money work for them and we're going to get there and they live off the rest. And they don't go live this crazy lifestyle and then break even at the end of the year. No, they're, they're plus, they're positive. Okay, that's two, pay yourself first. A way to do that is just create an account, either put in your 401k or create an account. Um, a 401k is if like, I don't wanna study investing, I don't wanna learn about assets, I just want it done for me. You're not gonna be able to access that to your 65, but you'll be able to retire. I advise doing some stuff outside of that too, but it's not just doing it, you gotta really learn it. Um, and we'll get that on the next step. So the third step on five to thrive in a recession is spend less than you make. We need to mind our money. What you track grows. You need to be aware of your money, of what comes in and what goes out. If you're just totally unaware of it, chances are you might be spending more than you make. We need to spend less than we make. We need to mind our money. We need to, what we track grows. If we start tracking Am I net positive or negative? Our net worth is our assets, cash, investments, anything, minus our liabilities, debt, credit cards, mortgage, whatever. When that's positive, we have a positive net worth. That should be the, that's the goal. I'm gonna say you should have a positive net worth and, and the goal is every month to grow that. Okay, I made five grand, I spent four. I grew my net worth by five, by one grand. That's great. We'll, we'll build from that, we'll build from there. So a call to action is you and or your spouse, husband, anyone you live with, anyone you share finances with, I want you to, a call to action on minding your money, 
Print out your last 90 days of bank statements, print them out, get a highlighter, and go through them. When you go through them, you're gonna to start to see what you spend and be like, whoa, I spent a lot of unnecessary money probably. Oh, what's the total that came in? 5,000, what's the total that went out? 6,000, oh my gosh, I'm negative 1,000. I had to go borrow, I had to go use someone else's money because I wanted to spend more than I made. It's irresponsible, I do it, I've done it, I do it sometimes still, I'm irresponsible, but I'm working on it. I'm mindful of it. And this is something I need to do because I haven't done it in a while. I need to print out the last 90 days and go through it all with my wife. And be like, all right, where are we at? Oh my gosh, I spent a lot on restaurants. Do we need to spend $1,500 this month on restaurants? Um, so going through that, and when you do make a habit of that, what you track grows. If you start to set a goal and track, I wanna make more than I spend, I wanna add to my net worth every month, there's apps now. I think True Bill is a great one. Um, what's Mint.com is a great one where it'll take all your assets, your cash, your accounts, whatever, maybe your mortgage or value of your home, minus your liabilities, and they'll be like, this is your net worth. Your goal should be every month, check your net worth. Did I grow it or did I shrink it? Um, so that's number three, spend less than you make. And that kind of goes into paying yourself first, right? When you pay yourself first, that 10, 20, 30%, maybe up to 40% and you spend the rest, you kind of know. You, you know you're on track for that. Now four, step four, this is huge. In building wealth or financial literacy, we need to understand how to accelerate our money. Financial freedom is when our money makes money. So for example, I have a goal of having $5 million in assets. I think I can probably earn 10% on that because I've really studied investments. I think I can do that. and. If $5 million is earning 10%, that's half a million dollars a year of my money just working and doing it. I'm not working for that. I'm not trading time for money. Now, of course, it took work to build a $5 million asset. But think about that. I could, like a $500,000 salary is great. One, uh, the government's going to take probably 40% of that. So that's really 300000 after taxes. And I'm working for that. I'm trading my time for money. Wealth is time. Wealth isn't money. Money can just buy you time. Wealth is time. It's time doing the things we love. It's being, it's being able to spend it with family, doing what you love with who you love. That's why I want to make money, not for the paper, not for the status, so I can do what I love with my family. So I can go, we have a goal of um, living in Switzerland next year for six months. So I can do things like that with my eight month old, she'll be like 18 month old daughter. Um, so, Back to making your money work for you, that is where we get financial freedom. And financial freedom is technically when your passive income, so let's say you have a stock portfolio or real estate or something or whatever, where your cash flow from that is more than your expenses. That's financial freedom. Passive income is more than your monthly expenses. You're like, wow, I didn't even have to work and my money made more money than I spent. Now, it's not... I don't want to say easy. It's not, it is simple to get there. Pay yourself first. Invest money. It is simple. It's not necessarily easy. It takes work. It takes intentionality. It takes studying, understanding finances and financial literacy and the mindset behind it and these people who are doing it, studying them, having mentors in that sense. So let's go through different asset classes. How do I make my money work for me? There's the stock market. As we know, that can go up or down, but over time, it's gonna go up about 7% on average over the last 100 years. So what we don't wanna do is have this short-term mindset of checking my stocks or investments every day, no. What I think, I wanna check it in a year, in two years, in three years, in five years, in seven years. So guess what? If you invest in stocks or real estate, generally speaking, five years from now, it's going to be up. Even if we're in a down economy and it goes down over the next year, they're going to be up in the next five years. Most likely, I can't promise anything, right? I'm not giving financial advice, just information. You choose to do with it what you want. But the stock market, we're in a bear market because the stocks, the, the Dow Jones, the S&P 500 are down about 20%. That means we're in a bear market and that usually means we're heading into the recession. But that's because they've been inflated so much and they've been going up since like 08, 09. And then we print money and it goes up during the pandemic and all these things. So now it's just correcting. But it's still, even though in the short term, it might look like this and then like this and like that. Over time, it's like, 
if you just do a line through it, it's just like a, a steady up. Even though there's going to be blips and blips along the way, it's going to steady go up. So we have to have a long-term mindset. Now, it depends. Some of us are in our 20s or 30s or 40s or 50s or 60s, so it looks a little different depending on your situation. And that's where you work with a financial advisor or a mentor or someone to be like, all right, let's work with where I'm at and my goals. We're all It's all customizable and, and personal, but these are general principles. So the stock market is a good way to build wealth. It's not how the wealthiest people build wealth, but it's a good way for the average person just to have their money start working for them. Now, since for me, the stock market is down 20%, I'm like, seems like it's on sale. It probably will continue to go down. I don't know for how long. I don't know by how much. So if I invested today, it might go down. But if I think I'm invested for five years from now, five years from now, it's going to be up. Can't promise that, but almost guaranteed. Almost. Um, so that's the stock market. How do you invest? There's, there's index funds. It's easy these days. The Robinhood app is great. One thing I, I'm doing, and you do this what, what you want, is I have the Robinhood app. It's an app, and I dollar cost average. What that means, basically every week, I put a certain amount. It could be 50, 100, whatever. Let's just say $100 into like a few different stocks or funds. And if you're going to pick stocks, one, you got to be educated on it. So it's not, you're not just shooting fish in a barrel. But it's like maybe I just do the index funds, which means following the general market. That's the best first step. Or companies that you believe will be around 20 years from now will innovate. Maybe like Apple or Google or things like that. Big companies that have been around. Microsoft that are going to continue to innovate. Um, but I, you know, you're not going to beat the market picking it. Just get money into the market. It just a hundred dollars in every week into the general stock market and index fund. You got to look this stuff up to go further on it is great. And that can be a part of your paying yourself first because that money, if it just automatically goes out and you don't see it, you're like, I'm automatically investing and that might, money might go up and down in the interim, but over time it's going to go up. Second is real estate. This is something you have to study. You can't just take a whim on real estate. You gotta have mentors, you gotta study it. I spent like 100 hours looking at deals, studying, researching real estate, listening to podcasts before I made my first real estate investment. Now we have five properties, we have 22 doors, we have one Airbnb, we have an 18 unit, and we have three single family homes, but it took time and energy. We don't just on a whim go invest in real estate. And But one way to do so is turnkey real estate. My first three were turnkey properties. There's this company, Spartan Invest. It's like the easiest way to get into real estate. Put 20% down. They do all the work. They're great track record. But real estate's another one. It's going to go maybe down a little bit over the next year, two years, who knows. But in five, seven, ten years, real estate's going to be up. What I love the most is cash flowing rental properties. So I have a place in Birmingham, Alabama. It costs about 100000 I had to put twenty down percent down it's 20,000 and I get like a thousand dollars in rent rent every month and I pay like 600 mortgage so cash flows four hundred dollars a month I love something like that because guess what that renter is paying the mortgage and I have four hundred dollars on top of that now of course there's things things can break there's taxes it's not perfect it's not risk-free but over time that house is going to appreciate I have someone in there paying the rent and that is like a steady way to build wealth over time. It's not a get rich quick, really nothing is. Crypto, the next thing. So real estate's something you have to study. You can get into funds, whatever. Um, cryptocurrency, everyone the last few years, I saw on Instagram, I saw a meme and I invested in Bitcoin. And now they're losing their shirts on crypto because it's down like 70%. And that is the principles of investing. Don't invest in what you don't understand. People were just getting in because they think they can get rich off of it. And some people did and might have, but generally speaking, when you invest from an uneducated standpoint, like you're probably gonna lose because there's way smarter people out there that are studying it and making it their craft and are like, wow, I'm gonna I'm gonna win here and you're gonna lose. So crypto, it's a tough one. Who knows? It could get shut down, it could all go to zero. Or it could go huge if it gets adopted by the financial institutions and Wall Street and everything. It's kind of in that in-between space. People, fear dictates all of this. The stock market, real estate, crypto, because it's people like, oh, I gotta get my money out, it's gonna go down, it's gonna, and that's like causes fluctuations. So it's really fear-based. So that's where when we build our mindset, Warren Buffett's like the best investor ever. 
wow, stock market's down, duh. It's been up for so long. Now people are getting scared. They're gonna pull their money out. Let me make sure I have a ton of liquidity so I can go in and buy stocks at a discount. I'll dollar cost average it. So I can go buy real estate at a discount. If someone believes in Bitcoin, they're gonna be like, wow, Bitcoin's down 70% from its high. Will it get back there? Let's find out. Buy it at a discount. So you, it can go up and down, but have that long-term mindset. Uh, infinite banking is something I love. It's life insurance, which is a great investment because right now the stock market is down 20%. I have a whole overfunded, I have a whole life insurance policy and it gains a five to 6% dividend tax-free. So it's like a 9% gain in the stock market because stock market I have to pay capital gains I have to pay taxes on. So while the stock market is down 20%, my, my life insurance policy is up five to 6%, just automatic. The US economy would have to like go down for that to crash. It's like through the big mutual, mass mutual companies, they've been around 200 years, they've been paying a five to 6% dividend for 200 years. So that's a great one, but that's something you really gotta study. You can look that up, you can ask me for a referral. I have a great whole life insurance, infinite banking um, agent that I work with, he's awesome. Barry, Barry Brooksby. And Melissa, if anyone wants to find out more about that, I actually have a webinar I did with them. I would recommend study it, research it, watch the webinar, hop on a call with them, understand. But that is a great way where you can pay yourself first. Money can just go into that. And that's legacy. I'm, I want to build wealth for legacy. I want to pass down money. I want to set up my daughter. Like when I pass, which I, I live a healthy lifestyle. So I'm, let's say at 120 when I pass. Like I want to be able to pass down millions and millions to my daughter. And so I have this life insurance policy, which has cash in it, but also has obviously the death benefit. And I use that to, to fund real estate deals and different things. There's a ton of intricacies there, but those are the basic assets that I invest in. There's obviously a lot more, but those are like some big ones. But that's number four. Overall, you have to get your money working for you or else you always have to work for money. You'll always have to work for money unless you save up enough and then just live off your savings, which is definitely possible. But you accelerate your money and wealth by having it work for you. Like I said, building a $5 million asset that earns 10%, I'm not lifting a finger and 500,000 is coming in every year, year after year. I could live off 500,000. What about you guys? Um, and building a $5 million asset is not easy, of course, but it's it, that's like when you set a goal, Set a goal and work towards it. Set a target. Um, all right, that's for the fifth one, and this is a simpler one, but we'll wrap it up here and then we can do any Q&A, is understanding taxes. Wealthy people understand the game of wealth. And I'm not, a, everyone's goal might not to be to get wealthy, but I'm sort of speaking to that. That's how my mind works. They understand wealth, they understand taxes, they understand money, they understand how to make it, they understand how to multiply it, how to invest, how to use it. They understand it's just paper with value attached to it that we value. They understand that their wealth is in direct correlation to the size of the problem they solve in the marketplace. If someone starts a business, it's going to be as successful as the problems that it solves. So it's really about the customer, who you're helping, or your guy's firm, or your guy's role in the company. Your value is as big as like the value you add, right? Or the problem you solve within the company. How do you get more valuable? How do you get more skills? Or put in more time, or whatever it is. That gets noticed, right? Sprouting where you're planted is the first thing. Getting really good at what you do gets noticed everywhere. But understanding taxes is something the wealthy do, and that's why you hear like Warren Buffett or all these people or Trump or everyone gets all pissed like because they don't pay taxes. When you understand money and the, the tax code, you get it. Because the government goes, hey, here's the tax code. It's not like these ways to penalize you. It's a list of incentives. My CPA taught me this, he's brilliant. He said, you gotta look at the tax code as a list of incentives. It goes, hey, start businesses, AKA employ people, Provide people security, which our brain naturally craves security. Why most of us are employees. We want to know the paychecks coming in every two weeks. We have benefits. We have everything. Our brain craves security. It's hardwired that way. It's, it's uncomfortable to break that. That's why it's uncomfortable for me to be an entrepreneur because it's like I got to eat what I kill. Like I have no security other than in myself. And I find ultimate security in that. 
And I'm not saying become an entrepreneur. There's, the world needs entrepreneurs, it needs inventors, it needs employees, it needs government, it needs social workers, it needs everyone. And everyone knows like where, where they wanna be and sprout where they're planted. But the wealthy understand taxes, the, the, the tax code, start businesses and employ people, own housing and house people. So start businesses, invest in real estate. My CPA said, do that, you will pay very little taxes. So my finance job, I used to pay like 40, 50% of my paycheck in taxes. Now as an entrepreneur, I pay very little because I own businesses and I employ people, I help other people make money and I own real estate, I house people. And you can use all these, like the government says, okay, you don't owe very much because you aren't needing security, you're creating security for other people. And so when you understand taxes and start to do that, so what are ways you as an employee could do that? Uh, you could start investing in real estate or invest in assets or different things. You could start a side hustle, start a side business. Owning a business, you have the opportunity to do write-offs and different things. Write off a little bit of your home, write off the trip you went on to meet a customer, a potential client, whatever it is. But understanding taxes is a huge way of building wealth. And I think there's a few things in the chat here. Yes, I can, I can send you guys who I use for, for life insurance. He's great. I'll type it in the chat and I'll send Melissa um, the webinar I did because it'll give you insight into him and what, what whole life insurance is and how to use it as an investment vehicle. I used to think of it as like, I'm not betting on when I'm gonna die and hopefully getting you know paid a certain amount for it. No, it's I didn't do it for the life insurance. That was a kicker. It was more an investment vehicle. But yeah, number five, understanding taxes. So to recap, five to thrive in a recession. One, your mindset and financial literacy. Pouring into that, read the books, do the things, surround yourself with the people understand the economy and money. Two, pay yourself first. 10% at a minimum, up to 30 or 40%, you're really gonna start to get ahead. Three, spend less than you make, mind your money. Print out 90 days of bank statements, go through it, understand where can I be better? Where can I make sure I'm spending less than I make, I'm making more than I spend? Four, make your money work for you. Understand the different asset classes, and if you don't wanna go be a pro at it, have someone do it for you. You're gonna pay for that, but have someone do it for you or understand, okay, an index fund is generally investing in the stock market. I can just put money there. Or this infinite banking whole life insurance policy is like, I don't have to mind my money. I can just understand it once, do it, and put 10% in there every year, 40% in it of every paycheck in. Five, understand taxes. Understand what am I paying now? How could I pay less? Work with a good CPA. Understand, okay, if I owned real estate or start a business, I could start to kind of chip away and I pay less taxes. Think about it, for all the less taxes you pay, that's what you're adding to your wealth or your net worth. So those are the five to thrive in a recession. They're general, they're mindset. It's just information, not advice. I'm not a financial advisor, but I wanted to, that's kind of all I had for you guys. I'd love to open it up to you, Melissa, or if anyone has any questions, we go from there. Oh, first Thank one. Thank you so much, Wade. This mm -hmm. was amazing. I feel like I need to go invest right away, but I think Brady has a question. So yes. how do you balance between fund spending now and saving for the future? Tomorrow isn't guaranteed for anyone. So you would have to live now, but also be responsible for saving in the year later years. So good. That is the, that's like the greatest question, right? Probably no questions are better than others, but how do I balance that? How do I live my life happy while also investing for my future? The goal is to, like you, you find the balance, you, you invest where you have that financial freedom. You're like, what comes in passively make, is more than I spend. So whatever I make, I can spend on fun. But there is a balance. You gotta understand your core values, what you value, and what legacy you wanna create and you do find the balance. So find the ways you can have fun while still spending less than you make and building towards your future. Fun can be going out to the park with your kids or, or going to the beach and the ocean or you know whatever it is, it can, there can be ways not to spend money or fun can be I'm gonna go bring my wife to Vegas for a weekend and hit it and spend three grand. Like, you know, it can be both. But at the end of the day, if you are 
having fun and, and spending more than you make, you're going into debt. You're setting yourself and your family up for financial, the opposite of success. Like, so it, it's really understand your core values. And if it's like tomorrow's not guaranteed, I'm gonna have a lot of fun, but I'm also gonna make sure I'm building my net worth every month. And if I wanna have a lot of fun, hey, maybe I gotta go make more money. Maybe I gotta get better at my current job. Maybe I gotta start another source of income, whatever that is. I think it's personal, that question. But there's, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. You figure it out. You understand what do I want? What are my core values? What do I want my legacy to be? And let me go from there and let me figure it out. Great question, though. Thank you. Thank you. Congrats on your baby girl. What is the biggest financial tip you have as a new parent? I have all girls, five year old, three year old, one year old, and would love to hear your thoughts. Maybe you separate lunch and learn. That's a great one because that's something I'm super focused on. My daughter's eight months. One thing I'm doing is she already has a few toys. She already has clothes. So guess what? In her first birthday, I'm saying, nope, no one's bringing presents. Here's Cam's, her name's Cameron, Cam's investment fund. You can, you can Venmo $25 or put money into her investment fund. Because guess what? When an eight month old or a one year old starts investing and getting $200 from all the family and relatives for her birthday and that goes into an investment fund. She has no expenses. Obviously we pay for her through 18 or whatever. And that starts growing. Compound interest is everything. If you don't know what compound interest is, let me put it this way. What would you rather have? Some of you may have heard this, some of you not. What's a good number? What would you rather? Me give you, let's type in the chat. I'll give you a million dollars today, million dollars in a briefcase, cash, all yours. Or I'll give you one penny today, and I'll but I'll double that penny every day for the next 30 days. What would you rather have off the gut? What do you think? Type in the chat. I'll wait. Get a sip of water. Penny, 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 penny. Is anyone going with the million? I know the right answer isn't actually what I want. Lindsay going with the million. All right, William's going with the million. Okay. All right, so if I give you one million today, first, here's what's important. We know lottery, people who win the lottery go broke, right? Within, I forget. And they actually, on average, get to a place worse off than they were before they won the lottery. So what does that mean? That goes back to our financial literacy, our mindset. You need to have the mindset of a millionaire if you're handed a million dollars. Otherwise, you're gonna squander it, you're gonna lose it, you might go on a great vacation, buy a boat, whatever, and then you're like, oh my gosh, I have no money left, I'm stuck with this boat payment or this house payment. So you need to have the, that's why the financial literacy, reading the books, like having the mentors and the people, you need to know what to do with it. You need to know what to do with a million dollars. You need to have the mindset of a millionaire or else like, <laughs> it's gonna go away. So. That's that's one thing. That's kind of side note, but <laughs> crushing your dreams. No, Matt, if you win the Mega Millions tonight, just go invest half of it, at least, into safe cash flowing assets, and you're good. Imagine if you win 10, 20 million, the government's gonna take half, you'll have 10. Go take that 5 million I talked about and put it into assets. And let's say you gain 5% super conservatively, 5%. That's 250 grand every year. You don't lift a finger is just coming into your bank account. Now, if you kept that in, it would keep compounding over time. Look, Google compound interest and we're going to go back to the penny. This is what it is. So if I give you a penny, you're like, oh my gosh, on day two, I should have this all in front of me. I don't. It's like, okay, I have two cents. On day three, I have four. On day four, I have eight. You're like, on day four, I have eight cents and that my coworker has a million dollars. I'm screwed. And you keep going and day 10 and day 20 and day 20, you still have like $32 or something. And day 20, you're like, I have 10 days left of this doubling and my coworker has a million dollars and I have, I have $32. You're like, what? Why did I listen to Wade? I thought it was a trick question. I went with a penny. But guess what happens? It's, it compounds. Because when money starts to grow on top of itself and you keep the money in there, 
it starts to keep going and growing and growing and growing. I, I w I'm i gonna send this to you guys or look it up after, but look, Google like a penny doubled every day for 30 days. By day 30, it's worth $5 million because I keep doubling your amount every day. I double your amount every day. It's worth 5 million, starting with a penny, just over 30 days. That is compound interest. That's money growing on itself. So when you invest money and it grows on itself over time in the long run, the stock market, you could invest, you could go out and be all fired up and invest in the stock market today and you might be down a year from today. Be like, why did I listen to Wade? No, you didn't listen to me. I just gave him. Stock and it, that company goes bankrupt. That's why you got to really know if you're going to pick stocks, you got to know about them. Are they going to be here 20 years from now? But, and if it's a 31 day month, Guess what? On day 30, it's worth 5 million ish. On day 31, it's worth 10 million. That's compound interest. Good financial advisor. Ah, it's a good question. Go to your network. Ask wealthy people you know. Go be like, who's who would I want to trade bank accounts with? Let me ask who their CPA is, who their financial advisor is, what they do with their money. Don't ask your mom if your mom has been, you know, kind of broke her whole life and not to diss your mom or my mom or anyone's mom. Don't ask your broke friends. Ask the people who you're like, I would trade bank accounts with them. Let me ask them. I don't have a particular financial advisor I recommend. Um, so back to that, the, the, so back to the question of the compound interest, but when a child starts building an investment and what if you just put $10 a month, every month in your children's investment account in some safe account, your financial advisor set you up, or you just bought index fund stocks, or maybe you bought $10 of Bitcoin a month if you want. Bitcoin is something that could go way up or it could go down. So have a balanced portfolio, have safe stuff, and then have a few maybe risky things, especially if you're younger. If you're older, closer to retirement, maybe don't have a lot of risky stuff. Um, so how I think about is I am investing and I actually open these life insurance policies for my children. I only have one, but, and that is an investment form because that's going to earn money over time. I'm going to put some money into it. It's going to grow on itself and grow on itself and grow on itself and grow on itself. And that is legacy, right? I have a legacy now. Whenever I die, hopefully it's at 120, there's going to be millions of dollars left behind because I have this life insurance policy. Um, and that's a whole nother topic. There's ways to accelerate money there. Um, so what I would do if you're five, three and one year old, what I would do if they were my five, three and one year old is just find your way, your safe way to invest in them. Now I own a business. So guess what? Cameron Credities gets, is on my payroll. I can pay her $12,000 a year for whatever. She's eight months old. She can't do anything. She can be a baby model though. There's all, that's what, when you understand the game, Wealthy people are like, oh, my kids all work for me. They're my assistant. They're my this. They get my mail. They whatever. They're my baby model. Here's 12000 Here's 12000 You're not getting it. It's going in your investment account. So when you start to understand these things, you're like, whoa, now I'm going to pay her 12000 this year. I pay zero taxes on that because that's an expense to me. That's a benefit of owning a business. Now you're like, wait, I don't own a business. There's turnkey ways to own a business. Melissa's Arbonne business, for example, is a, a way she can do some of this stuff. I can do it. Um, but there's, it, it gets deep. There's a lot of things to it. But that's why we can't just listen to one webinar and be like, I know how to get wealthy now. You have the tools. You have some resources to go do your own research. So with your five, three, and one-year-old, with my five, three, and one-year-old, I'm going to have life insurance policies on them. I'm going to put money into that on their birthdays. Of course, they'll get some clothes and toys or a trip or whatever. But more so, I'm going to say, hey, if you're giving a present family, it's going to their investment fund. Guess what? In the beginning, I'll get them a few toys from Target on my own. And in the end, in the long run, and I know grandma is going to be like, I want to get the, the, the cute dress for her, whatever, and just, I'll let her do that. But in the long run, by the time they're 18, they're going to be like, holy, I have 60000 in an investment account? Because you just, we're just, every you know month, you put a little bit in, because every birthday, I got a few hundred in. Now it's worth thousands, tens of thousands, like that's amazing. Um, you could set up college investment accounts for them. Um, but I think I know that we're coming up on an hour on the lunch and learns probably time to get back to work. Right, Melissa? Sure.
Yeah, mm -hmm. we do. But um, maybe just one more question from Ashley. She yeah. had said, any recommendations for finding a good financial advisor? Yeah, yeah. So that my recommendation there is just go talk to the people that you look up to financially. Go oh. talk to people you trade bank accounts with or you think. You don't know what people are doing. And it's the people who are driving all the cars and things. Who knows? Behind the scenes, they might be like underwater, like, wow. But who you get a sense for, you're like, they have, a, they have a good marriage, they have a good family life, they probably have a good bank account, they aren't like the flashy, I'm, I'm rich, but like I can feel they probably have some sort of wealth. Hey, who's your financial advisor? Hey, who's your CPA? Go like, go find the people that are doing it and there will be fruits of their experience, right? So go ask them. But thank you so much for having me, you guys. I appreciate you, I appreciate you, Melissa. I hope this is helpful. Yeah, you can. I mainly hang out on Instagram. You can, you can follow me at Wellness with Wade. Oh, I've been doing Finance Fridays on our podcast. So we have a podcast, Getting Magnetic, and I'm gonna start to do as we're going into recession, Finance Fridays. So there's gonna be bits and pieces you'll learn. That's another way to build financial literacy, right? Um, but thank you so much, you guys. I appreciate you. I look forward to connecting. And yeah, if there's any other questions, I can connect with Melissa from here. Amazing. Thank you so much, Wade. We Thank appreciate you. your time. All right. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. Oh, yes. I'm still live on Facebook. What up, guys? Wow. How's this work?